Hello and welcome to the Hans Brinka Leadership Series, Extraordinary Leaders in Extraordinary Times by Adi Partners. As founder and chairman Adi Partners, I am delighted to launch our leadership series. I am Sanjay Vishwanathan. COVID-19, the pandemic of this millennium, has changed our daily lives irrevocably. At the firm, we believe people fighting this pandemic at the coal face in healthcare, travel, supply chain, government, nonprofit, and media deserve recognition. As a global firm across Asia to North America with 19 cities in between that creates value through technology, I'm pleased that Adi Partners has conceived this program. Absolutely. In fact, over the next several weeks, we will identify and share world-class practices to combat COVID-19 and create a cohort of champions who can influence, energize this war against coronavirus. I am Eral Desai. Through the Hans Brinker Leadership Series, we will identify extraordinary leaders in these extraordinary times. Similar to legendary 15-year-old boy who mythically saved his nation from being flooded. The series will provide everyday leaders a platform for sharing best practices and appreciate their efforts in the fight against COVID-19. A journey, in fact, will take us to India, Middle East, UK, Europe, America, Far East, and China. So as we saw in the prior episodes, this war against the coronavirus cannot be won only physiologically. It also needs to be won at a mental health level. And that's what we think needs paid attention to. Experts we speak to across both sociologists as well as uh, psychologists and psychiatrists tell us that anxiety levels have increased a whopping 67%. Domestic violence has gone up 25%. Loneliness and depression by 22%. And suicide rates by a fifth at 20%. In today's episode, we want to delve into the human mind and explore the relevance of mental wellness to COVID. In this context, I am pleased to introduce you to Dr. Raka Maitra from the UK, who specializes in psychiatry. It's fascinating that we have you here on the show, Raka, because you know, we've always been looking only at the adult dimension. So I think to look at it from a, a children's dimension will also be a very interesting perspective you can throw on us. Um, Raka is currently leading a unique project that supports doctors stranded in the UK during the COVID-19 crisis. Absolutely, Sanjay. Uh, welcome to the show, Raka. Raka, my first question is that the main consequences of COVID-19 have been stress, anxiety and depression. How do you see it from your perspective if you have to keep the current environment in mind? So first of all, thank you both for having me in this program. And it's a great honor to be here. Um, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm still training in my child psychiatry and psychotherapy. Um, and uh, it is definitely, as Sanjay said, really important to look at the mental health aspects. And, you know, mental health aspects are very much related to everything else that is happening. Nothing happens in isolation. So. COVID-19 is bringing us lots of new socioeconomical challenges that, you know, people might be dealing with unemployment, poverty, uncertainty of work, which has a direct connection with mental health, has a direct connection of, of you know, mental health of parents, at the same time having to work during this pandemic also is an additional stress to, on the parents and then consequently on the children who now don't even have access to schools or colleges. So these are the different ways in which COVID-19 is actually affecting our lives and we can't really separate the physical from the mental. Right. In fact, uh, Raka, let me come to you. Uh, how do you think this pandemic has affected the mental health of children and adolescents? Because there are a lot of children who would be going through stress right now. They have been locked up in their homes. 
what could be the kind of tips that you would actually want to give your give parents as well who are handling these children thanks for the question hiril so it kind of affects in different ways and i think we have to look at things in different chunks so you know children and adolescents who were leading a normal life going to schools and colleges and now not being able to is one subset children and adolescents who had some already some physical or mental health challenges now on top of that not going to school and colleges is another subset children and adolescents who are living in families where maybe somebody already has mm. a physical or mental health challenge is another subset children and adolescents living in families who now face real dangers of poverty and unemployment is another subset so i think we can't say one size fits all we can't say the same kind of things affects everybody we can't say lockdown is good or bad because it's a mixture of both and you know the other very important thing to remember actually two very important things to remember about being a child and adolescent really is that this is a stage when you are still developing and uh, for babies and children your brain is still developing for adolescents yes part of your brain is still developing and the main part of brain that is developing is actually your social world and how you navigate through it and which is why when you know apart from education schools and colleges give us that platform to be able to develop into who we finally become and that opportunity at the moment has been taken away from them right at the same time i just want to mm-hmm. add mm-hmm. is that being able to spend time with their families okay can be an added bonus if the parents and everybody in the family is able to cope mm-hmm. so everything is quite interlinked that's fascinating uh, raka um how do you think uh, your role would change in a post covid era that's that's a very interesting question and actually some of the answers we still don't know so for example we don't know what are the long term effects of covid-19 really we don't know what are the effects of altruism and um you know well being uh we d- we don't know that we also don't know that currently the digital way of reaching out is this going to be sustainable is it actually going to prove to be really beneficial or not we don't know so therefore this is where social scientists and other scientists come in where post covid we really need, need to look at seriously at what worked Uh, to make sure that that is incorporated into the future and who knows we might be looking into a way where we are working in a more flexible manner to bring a better work life balance both for the healthcare professionals and the patients we look after because maybe a blended way of face to face and this digital connection because we are in a digital era anyway might just be something that becomes uh, a different way of working post covid so i do think that there are going to be changes post covid in the way we work i just don't know what different levels it would be a change in indeed indeed and um when you uh, look at technology and the role technology can play to enable your role um to be more effective uh for example having more um online or video or chat based platforms to deliver your set of services do you think that uh, that's a possibility in the in the post covid era so i think technology has pluses and minuses right on one hand all the information overload we have right now which is actually contributing to the anxiety is through media is technology right but on the other hand the that we are able to carry on our services and actually reach the people uh we need to is via technology i don't know how it's really working in you know places in india where um phone might be an issue i don't know that i can only talk about uk but um technology is certainly allowing us to function as a team 
to plan for our services and to actually deliver our services. So I do think that, you know, although right now there are a lot of questions on which platforms are secure or not and things like that, that uh, I do think post-COVID technology will remain as an important avenue of reaching out. It's just that we need to fine tune it so that people who are at very great risk uh, will not be sidelined, but actually will have a way of um, safely reaching out and accessing services, which to an extent have existed even pre-COVID. So for example, in the yes. UK, you, know, you can text uh, organizations if let's say you're facing domestic violence and things like that. There are child helplines where a child can just call up. So, you know, some of these things have existed, but it might be that COVID makes us realize how much more important they really are to really plan for it to expand uh, even in a post-COVID era. Absolutely. Uh, and do you see technology as a way to enhance outcomes or does it actually hinder outcomes when it comes to mental wellness? I think we're at very early stages right now, really. So at this stage, all we can say is that people are engaging. So when the, you know, uh, follow-ups and interventions are being offered online, people are taking it up. And we are at that stage where we can say technology has allowed us to continue engagement. But how effective it will be is something that needs to be properly studied and is something that we probably have answers only at the end of COVID rather than right now. But right now already it's encouraging that people are engaging via these platforms which are all very new to everybody. It's a very different way of working. Hmm. That's very interesting, uh, Raka. Could you give us a little more insights into uh, the unique initiative that you are working on in the UK? Thank you for asking. That is an initiative that is not related to child and adolescence because these are all adults. Um, these are young doctors who are stranded in the UK. They came here to give an exam, which is a licensing exam for doctors, and that got cancelled as a preventative measure during COVID, like lots of events got cancelled. But now that it got cancelled, and then at the same time, governments decided that flights are going to be cancelled as well, that they were unable to fly back to their home countries. And so these are uh, doctors from different countries. We've got people from India, Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Burma, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, United Arab Emirates, um, Libya, all sorts of places. Um, and they're all stranded here and they don't have family and friends, very few do. And uh, at the same time, there's this uncertainty of how long the lockdown will be. So, you know, on one hand, they face the challenge of financial hardship. And on the other hand, their education and everything has been stopped. Uh, and they don't know when they can return to their families. So, so me and some of my colleagues, and currently also being helped by um, an organization who are British Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, so BAPIO, but they are actually helping everybody from all the countries. And what we have done is initially we looked at the physical health needs, um, not physical health needs, as in the physical needs, sorry, and we provided accommodation and food at that accommodation. And uh, otherwise what we're doing for some who are comfortable in the accommodation they are or are living with family and friends. We are kind of making sure that we have, um, initially it was like twice weekly that, you know, we meet, we bond, we bond as a global community. They don't feel isolated. And at the same time, you know, with all these uncertainties that they're still able to focus. And currently there's a role confusion because they're doctors, but yeah. they can't do anything. They're not legally 
um, in a situation to work in this country, they can't fly back to work in their countries. All they have known themselves to be is doctors and the, that's the last thing they're able to do. So, you know, there's a, a bit of a loss of sense of identity. And so what we do is also organize a lot of educational activities so that at least they're in that conversation, they keep up their medical knowledge and skills and they're ready whenever it will be possible for them to jump back into work and at the same time wouldn't feel that you know they've been isolated without help guilty that they can't do anything so all these very complex emotions uh, we hope that their resilience will come above that and they will be ready whenever it is possible for them to work again. Yes, that's an interesting point and, uh, that you have made, uh, Rakha. But overall, uh, if you go to see right now, uh, the, the kind of people that you're treating as well, a couple of things that come to our mind is that there will be a lot of challenges that you're facing on a daily basis while treating patients. How are you overcoming those challenges and what do these challenges look like? So the challenge is, the first challenge actually is balancing work life really, because you're at home, but you're working, so you're not really with your family, right? So work-life balance is, it's a new kind of work-life balance challenge. And it's very important to have those boundaries. At the same time, it's really important to be mindful of one's strengths and limitations. And I think the moment, you know, the more we are aware of our strengths and limitations, we can work on it. So I absolutely encourage, uh, engage in very honest conversations with my work group when I'm working so that we share the challenges we are sharing as a group and kind of see what the solutions might be to be able to function more effectively at, as a group. And similarly, I, I'm very honest even with my family and we kind of sit and see, you know, what challenges everybody's facing, what kind of worries there are. It's very important to be really honest with children and it's a delicate balance between the honesty and how much information do you give depending on you know their developmental age so the, it is important to be honest but it's not important to give all the details necessary right and and the more we share and at the same time role model as to how we are coping which then becomes a role model both for our you know uh, people we're working with and our families including children then it's like we're all as a group kind of increasing um, and strengthening our resilience. Right. Uh, so how are you retaining your calmness amidst all this chaos? Because I understand that, you know, you're sharing your experiences, uh, discussing them with your children. But do you think something like this could actually affect your relationship as a doctor with close friends and family? That's a really important question and a question that many of us has, have had to reflect on and come to a new balance. So, you know, taking care of oneself becomes really important. And personally, for me, um, three things are very important for my mental well-being. So first is a bit of time spending on something spiritual. Second is a bit of time spending on making sure, you know, I am taking care of my physical health. Third is to rest and rewind. And once these three are there, it, it makes me a person who can, you know, engage much more effectively and productively with both my work group and my family. I then have the mental space uh, to, to allow um, other people's anxieties, worries, and at the same time, you know, find time to actually share the good that is happening as well. Right. So overall, uh, when we emerge from all this, we could probably imagine a society of people not shaking hands, probably not giving a hug, social distancing, wearing masks and gloves. In fact, economists are also predicting, Raka, that social venues like cinema halls, theme parks, airports, malls, now, the footfall is expected to decline at all these locations and there will probably be new forms of social behavior that will actually take root. What do you think the post-COVID era will look like in the UK and elsewhere? 
So, Hiral, what you've just told me uh, seems like we're expecting a very, very traumatized society because it's only if a society is really traumatized with this experience that they will never hug again, and never shake hands again. I am not such a pessimist by nature. So I'm not, you know, I, I'd recognize that there, this is a traumatic experience. And some of us will be quite trauma traumatized by this whole experience. But I'm also expecting as humans that, you know, we will also show a lot of resilience where we are able to think of a society that functions a bit more differently. And I'm hoping that actually kindness and consideration for others will become quite important in the way we think because COVID-19 has shown us that it's not about one person and it's not about one person's actions, but actually we all affect each other and we need to keep everybody in mind. So COVID-19 kind of has reminded us that we are a society and I'm hoping that uh, from this, what will emerge is policies which uh, take that into account and, you know, our education system that takes that into account and our workplaces that takes that into account so that we are able to be a much more considerate society working way more collaboratively. And that's my hope. Right. And that's something which is really positive because uh, clearly a fascinating, insightful discussion, Sanjay. Uh, everyone's been talking about negativity across uh, what is the negative impact of COVID. And now when you know, Raka is actually referring to a society coming together, I don't think so many of us have looked at it that way. Indeed, Hira. Uh, you know, the mind is such an amazing ocean with uh, such depth and layers to it. Uh, and I'm excited, very excited uh, to discover and explore more in this journey uh, about the mind and its dimensions. Uh, here, right here on the Hans Brinker Leadership Series. In fact, thank you, Raka, for joining in as well. And thank you, viewers. Sanjay and I will be back tomorrow, same time, to share more extraordinary leaders in extraordinary times. See you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.